All ecosystems rely on circularity to function, and changing the conditions will usually lead to adaptations that create a new balance. Sometimes, however, the conditions change so rapidly and drastically, it takes years or even decades for a new balance to be established. Such was the case here. For an ecosystem to function long term, nutrients trapped in plant matter and carcasses need to be recycled and made available to new life. For that function, vultures have a crucial role in many parts of the world. In India alone, the vulture population was around 40 million at this point, which kept the system in balance. But that population soon saw the sharpest decline of any animal known to man, and within 40 years, more than 99.9% .9 of all vultures had been lost. With so few vultures remaining, animal carcasses were left out in nature for longer periods of time leading to drinking water contamination and an increase of rats and feral dogs. The number of feral dogs increased by at least 5 million, which resulted in 38 million more dog bites and 47,000 additional deaths by rabies. The economic impact of the vulture population decline has also been estimated to be around $34 billion in just the 14-year span between 1992 and 2006. So what had this devastating effect? The culprit was the anti-inflammatory and non-steroidal drug diclofenac, which had been extensively used on livestock. The drug has since been banned for veterinary applications in India, but globally we still use 2,400 tons of it every year to treat pain and arthritis, most commonly in gel form. Only 6-7% to of the drug is, however, absorbed through the skin when applied topically. The rest is flushed down the drain. In fact, the average concentration of diclofenac in wastewater treatment facilities in the southernmost region of Sweden, Scania, has been shown to be 17 times higher than the current environmental quality standard set by the European Union. This level is set at the highest concentration considered safe for aquatic life, and above it, harm can come to aquatic species. Now, with a clear problem identified, we can move on to a possible solution. To solve a problem of this scope, it is important to consider all aspects of why the problem exists and what would be needed to fix it. It was clear to us that we wanted to degrade diclofenac using synthetic biology. The question then became how a solution could be applied in practice. Targeting the individual using the product, the wastewater containing diclofenac, or the diclofenac already present in nature. We chose the wastewater route and were able to visit a wastewater treatment plant in Lund. Elin Ossianson at Shelby provided us with great insight and valuable input on wastewater treatment operations today, and how we could shape our project to work with the systems in place. Our choice to work with wastewater treatment also guided us to Bacillus septalis, a bacterial species already present in many wastewater treatment plants. We also wanted to work with lacases that can degrade diclofenac, and had two different approaches for this insertion of foreign lacases into the bacteria and improving the lacase native to B. subtilis using both directed evolution and rational design. Even though B. subtilis was a hoax organism we ended up working with, we did do a lot of work in the lab using E. coli. E. coli is well known and easy to transform, and thus it was used as a stepping stone on the path to working with B. subtilis. Using a shuttle vector, the goal was to eventually transform our constructs into B. subtilis. Our first vector, PET11A, was used to introduce three different lacases into E. coli. PET11A has the origin of replication needed for E. coli and a T7 promoter and terminator surrounding the restriction site. For selection pressure, the vector has ampicillin resistance. The three different lacases that we work with were the B subtilis native lacase CODA, the bacterial lacase YUC, and the fungal lacase LCC1. In order to do restriction cloning and get the lacase genes into PET11A, we digested both the inserts and the plasmid using NDE1 and BAMH1, after which the insert was transformed into E. coli using the heat shock method. The cells were thereafter plated on agar, when a bacillin and incubated overnight. The transformers were screened to verify that the correct fragment had been inserted, and not just the empty plasmid or another piece of DNA. For the screening, we did colony PCR and gel electrophoresis. We also sent the DNA for sequencing, and through these measures, we could confirm that all three lacase genes had been correctly transformed into our E. coli. 
We used error-prone PCR on COD-A in order to improve its function. This was done at several different concentrations of manganese chloride in order to vary the rate at which mutations are incorporated into the genome. To test how this would impact the activity, we did a lac case assay using syringal design as a substrate. The product turns pink and absorbs light at a specific wavelength, making it quantifiable. The bacteria transformed with the lacase genes were cultivated in a 6 well plate. The proteins were expressed and the cells were lysed. Through the lacase assay, we found that some of our enzymes showed different activity from the control of unmodified CARE. Those that indicated a slightly higher activity were sent for sequencing to determine what, if any, mutations had been introduced. One of the screened samples with an apparent increase in activity was thereby shown to have a mutation. In our attempt to rationally design a lacase with higher specificity for diclofenac, we used three different tools. Firstly, we used Autodoc and Chimera to find the optimal binding site. Then we used Pyroceta to get possible mutations that could improve this binding site affinity for diclofenac. We received a lot of help from Ingmar André and Mats Jepsen at the Department of Biochemistry. They both helped us gain a theoretical understanding of how to model protein-ligand interactions, as well as how to use Pyroceta and how the software could be implemented to our project. The genes for the three new enzymes were introduced in E. coli and were shown to be expressed. In the end, we had three new enzymes that could be tested in the lab for their ability to degrade diclofenac. They were then tested using the lacase assay with syringaldesine, but they showed no activity possibly because they were optimized for diclofenac as substrate, or because the mutations had a negative effect on the activity. With E. coli, we knew we had a familiar platform for making genetic modifications, expressing the enzymes, and measuring that expression. Other species can be more difficult to work with, but to integrate our solution in a wastewater treatment plant, we knew we needed to use something other than E. coli. There are many different bacterial species present in the treatment of wastewater. One of them is Bacillus subtilis the host organism we chose for this very reason. Another reason we wanted to work with bacillus is that it can form a biofilm, which can later be used to facilitate the degradation of diclofenac and for the implementation of the bacterial population in a real-world scenario. The lab strain we work with has very low biofilm forming ability, but one can work with a biofilm forming strain in a very similar way. In order to work with Bacillus, we spoke to last year's iGEM Lund team since they worked with the same bacterial strain. We also talked to Klaus von Wachenfeld, a senior lecturer at Lund University who also works with these microbes. He helped us with the design of our construct and provided us with a strain, a vector and protocols. The vector we received, PCW101, is a shuttle vector, meaning it has the replication origins for both E. coli and Bacillus subtilis as well as the integration side for the gene of interest. Additionally, it has the AMI-E integration side, which allows chromosomal integration into the bacillus genome. Like with the E. coli vector, we used restriction cloning for the insertion of the lacase genes into the vector. But in this case, we used PAC1 and BAMH1 for digestion. In bacillus, we only work with the lacases YAC and LCC1, since COD-A is native for bacillus. The PVEC promoter was added next to the lacase genes to ensure strong gene expression. To further improve the degradation of diclofenac, the signal peptide WAP-A was attached to the C-terminus of the proteins. This would later cause the secretion of the lacases. Both lacases were tested with and without the signal peptide. Chromosomal integration was achieved through self-induced competence. The gene of interest replaces the alpha amylase gene in the bacillus genome by homologous recombination, which allows us to test for successful integration by a starch test. We could therefore conclude that we managed to get successful integration of the LCC1 gene, both with and without the signal peptide, and also the YAC gene. To determine whether our enzymes were indeed produced by the cells, we used SDS page. This way, we could determine if proteins of the correct size were present in the solution obtained after lysing the cells. We could therefore determine that all constructs in E. coli, including the three rational design ones and the three that were successful for B. subtilis, express proteins that matched the correct size. To measure the level of degradation for diclofenac, we used HPLC, running with a mobile phase consisting of orthophosphoric acid and acetonitrile. By overlaying the results from samples taken at different times, we could get a good visualization of how the diclofenac levels decreased over time. 
Sadly, due to recurring malfunctions of the machine, we were unable to test all taken samples. To understand how the formation of a biofilm might be beneficial to our project, we created a model for the diffusion and degradation of diclofenac within a biofilm. The model was based on factors such as enzyme and substrate concentration, biomass density, and enzyme kinetics. We consulted previous studies on enzyme activity for other types of substrates to get a sense of the enzyme kinetics that might be applicable to our project. Whenever working in the lab, we were never alone and we always wore lab coats and safety goggles. We also used gloves whenever necessary. We always made sure that our risk assessments were properly filled out and that they followed the regulations for the chemical center, which is where our lab is. We always kept fire safety in mind, especially when working sterilely by the flame. And of course, everything that came in contact with bacteria was autoclaved. During our study visit to our local wastewater treatment plant, we talked about the viability of our solution and possible ways of implementing it. One important consideration is that it's hard to introduce bacteria to a new environment, and just releasing our bacillus into the wastewater treatment plant would probably kill them. It would be possible to implement a new treatment step with just our bacteria. However, this would be pretty energy and resource intensive, which is exactly what we're trying to avoid. That's why we started looking into other options. We also talked to Marida Ekenberg, who works at a company called Anox Kaldness, to talk about carriers for growing our bacteria. The good thing about carriers is that they form a protected environment, which could help our bacteria survive in the wastewater treatment plant. And they could also help our bacteria from getting washed away. The other good thing about carriers is that they could help the bacteria form a biofilm, which could in turn help with degradation. That's why we think carriers are an important next step in implementing DECO. Finally, we wanted to look into how our solution could be adopted. For many solutions to be accepted, there needs to be public awareness about the problem, and for legislation to be passed, public opinion needs to be in favor of fixing the problem. We realized there are more sides to the diclofenac problem than just the lack of pharmaceutical degradation. We decided to refocus DECO to include all these different aspects and tackle the diclofenac problem from more than one perspective. First, we wanted to learn more about how people use diclofenac and their knowledge on its environmental effects. So we created a survey that essentially taught us people don't know that much about it. That's why we wanted to reach out to people and teach them how to avoid releasing diclofenac into the environment. In that effort, we created social media posts, posters, and an article for the school paper. Doctors also have an important role in minimizing environmental effects through their prescriptions and recommendations. We held a lunch lecture with doctors to talk to them about pharmaceutical pollution, and we learned that many doctors are already wary of diclofenac due to its negative side effects. We've also tried to reach out to diclofenac distributors to talk to them about pharmaceutical pollution, but their interest in discussing the topic with us was pretty limited. Diclofenac outreach aside, we also believe it's important to educate young people on the topic of synthetic biology. We've held several workshops for local high schools and middle schools and received very positive feedback and learned a lot about education and scientific communication. Even if the issue of a single pollutant is solved, we cannot at this time predict which drugs are going to threaten the stability of ecosystems in the future. There is therefore a clear need for flexible, proactive approaches that can neutralize harmful pharmaceuticals before they reach the environment. This would be a necessary step towards making pharmaceutical supply chains sustainable and in minimizing our impact on the environment. By using species capable of thriving in wastewater treatment plants and recombinant lacases that can target specific molecules, we could tackle a multitude of emerging pollutants, such as hormonal disruptors, pesticides, and antibiotics. This can help us reduce the environmental impact of treated wastewater, ensure that pharmaceuticals can be used without impacting the environment, and lessen the stress on aquatic ecosystems.